the rest of the speakers sit around and listen to Tab Atkins answer all your questions about CSS. <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> Um, we're going to get started up here with a couple of questions that I'll, I'll just start it off here and then we'll pass some microphones out to you and you could all ask your questions uh, to tab. <laughs> right. So, so uh, let me get started here with one that I thought was uh, a nice cage match for uh, Ethan and PPK. Oh God. <laughs> um, What's the advantage of using M's for your media queries uh, when considering the fact that PPK was talking about ideal viewport in terms of pixels? Um, for me, they're stylistic more than anything. I mean, I, I like some notional connection between the size of the text that I'm setting and the, the viewport that I'm working in, but um, roughly speaking, I mean, pixels would be fine. I, you know, they're roughly equivalent functionality-wise as well, especially with some Zoom bugs that have gotten fixed, so yeah. It's really just kind of a, it's more of a preference on my standpoint. So I don't know of any issues with them. They've been fine. So, yeah. Okay, that's not very exciting. No. <laughs> we all agree. Yes, I agree. <laughs> well, all right, one. Oh, okay. And, oh, well, here we go. My, has my mic amped up uh, yet? There used oh, yeah. to be problems on Zoom when uh, using pixels. Right. Yeah, but those have been resolved now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, it's less of an issue, but. Um, yeah. No, there were some, like, no, some, no. some evergreen browsers that just kind of wrap, like, fixed the bug last year. I yeah. think it was like last yeah, summer. Last like, I know Chrome and Firefox had slightly different implementations. Yeah. But, um, yeah. And for one extra detail, um, media query M's are a different beast from normal M's anyway. Yeah. They're just the document's default font size, which is almost always going to be 16 pixels. Mm -hmm. um, it can be adjusted, but in the vast majority of cases, it's a straight 16 to 1 ratio between M's and pixels anyway, so you right. treat them the same. Yeah. So I want to I do a quick round here because everyone who works with CSS, and some of you actually work on CSS, um, everyone has their ideas of what they want, their little pet thing they want in CSS. I'm, I'm sure everyone here has that. So we'll start with you, Ethan. Oh, again, geez. Um, uh, honestly, most of the stuff Tab was talking about today is stuff that's kind of been on my wish list for a long time. I mean, I'm still relying on floats entirely too much for my layouts and um, you know, Flexbox and Grid specifically are things I've been really excited about for a while. Um, beyond that, I think um, you know, the Responsive Images community group just worked out a, uh, I mean, Picture is something I'm really excited about, but they just, uh, they've sort of moved on to an element queries use case, which is something I'm kind of excited about. Um, mm -hmm. Tab's written really beautifully about some of the technical uh, roadblocks to something like that. But just from, from a design standpoint, as I've been doing more work on like these small layout systems, that's, you know, I'm, I'm using media queries that are sort of like a, they're, they're pulling the, the width of the, the viewport, you know, to talk about how this design should adapt its specific widths unique to that element. Um, and so managing that in one, one area would be pretty cool. Web components will help address some of that, I guess. But that's, uh, that's kind of the other thing I'm really excited about. See where it goes. Yeah, I kind of feel like an imposter here because I'm more of a JavaScript slash HTML guy. So, uh, but Shh, don't tell anybody. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so forgot I said that. Um, well, back when I was still younger, I always dreamed of being able to do something like this in CSS, where you could leverage your browser's support for syntax highlighting because every browser has support for that. It parses HTML and CSS, and in the Dev Tools or even in the Viewer Source pane, mm. uh, it highlights that code for you. So I always wanted to be able to do this from <laughs> CSS, like just say syntax highlight this using this programming language that the browser knows. And then, well, you would probably have to specify the colors some way if you don't want to use the default version for the browser. But it sounds, I mean, it sounded like a very good idea at the time, but the more <laughs> I work in web standards, the more I realize how complex it would probably be. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What I've been thinking about for a while is uh, some uh, extensions to media queries where we could, for instance, measure the connection speed or uh, and that kind of stuff, uh, more, more like kind of environmental variables. Um, uh, actually, I was uh, thinking about, uh, I've, uh, I've done a report on uh, connection speed stuff uh, once, and I was all for it, and I thought, oh yeah, it's going to be wonderful. And then three months later, I reread my own report and thought, 
nah, it's not going to work. So <laughs> I'm not totally sure if it's going to be a viable idea, but it would be kind of cool to have a simple way of detecting environment stuff, especially on mobile. And I realize it sounds a bit vague, but I'm afraid that every specific example I'm going to bring up is going to be shut down. But <laughs> something like that. So I can shoot down your band with one. I wrote a blog post about it. But um, <laughs> everything else, just suggest on www style, and we'll see what happens. More. I'm writing media queries yeah. for right now. What? Yeah, that's a bit outside the scope, maybe, but an HTTP header to uh, give you the device uh, screen uh, width and height. Mm. So, Suggested. I don't okay. know. I can't do it here. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, disappointing. Someone my laptop. I'm away from it. Yeah. yeah. Um, my big one was expressed at the end of my talk. I am going for extending, making as many parts of CSS extensible as possible. And I've got a road plan for a bunch of it. I've got a bunch more that I want to do and don't know how to yet. But basically, if, you can, if we can just make it so that every part of CSS could be opened up to JS, my dream would be fulfilled. Hmm. Now that Matthias um, mentions it, even though I hadn't even considered the possibility, I do like the idea of leveraging the syntax highlighter, which is already already in dev tools uh, in different browsers. Also, I'd like to be able to style select elements. That would be nice. Mm. Oh, yeah. Another reason I drink. <laughs> probably, probably other form controls, too, having, <laughs> having, having heard the complaints. Um, I don't know. I, I think I would, there are probably a bunch of different things on my list. I mean, I. I agree with a whole bunch of the suggestions already made. Some other things that come to mind are grid, which Tab talked about earlier, and I don't know, maybe considers done already. Well, I'm all trying to make it done. <laughs> um, Elika won't let me publish it. it um, so, some other things I would like to see happen are, and, and I'm kind of, well, one of them is probably not too interesting for this audience, but better, better support for non-Western languages. Um, CSS has not, CSS is pretty Western-centric. Um, and d vertical, like we're starting to work on vertical text. There's a whole bunch of other aspects of design in Japanese that we don't account for, and we haven't really even talked about what design is like outside of Western and Japanese traditions, really. Um, I, think th I think there's a bunch of interesting things with um, fixing the inline box model so that people can get things like consistent line spacing, um, line grid. S some of those I really don't know how important people consider them. <laughs> Um, relative to how much work they're going to be to solve. Right. Um, and feedback on that sort of thing is probably useful, although I'm really not sure how to gather it coherently. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and say it, Tab. What? No, no, it's cool. Vertical rhythm. Great. Vertical yep. rhythm. When he said line grid, when David said line grid, I saw this kind of thing yeah. happen. I want shows. it. You want it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so mine is more of a visual thing. Um, but I would like a possibility to create shapes that is both consistent for various types of shapes. And um, it also offers me uh, the possibility that uh, the area of the shape is exactly uh, the target area for the hover. Mm. Because right now, mm. none of the methods that I know of uh, fulfills both conditions. Some one, some the other, some none of them. <laughs> <laughs> doable, doable. Is well, it, like today mm -hmm. or yeah, yeah. No. like right now, like a yeah. hackathon. Right. So you just mean like two-dimensional shapes, stuff things. Um, yeah. So SVG doesn't make you happy right now. Uh, not really. That, that's a totally I was, reasonable. Yeah. I was, I was thinking. <laughs> I was thinking about CSS, and the thing with SVG, I've 
I've complained about that uh, before. Uh, I've started uh, recently playing with clip path and um, uh, shape functions. And with shape functions, when I use them, I have uh, the option of using different units for every point. Mm -hmm. So I can use viewport units for one coordinate of uh, a point. I can use percentages for the other coordinate. Next point may be in pixels and in M's. Mm -hmm. But with SVG, I don't have this option. Yes, it's a historical weakness that uh, we're kind of planning to fix in SVG too. Mm -hmm. um, a big problem is that the biggest place where you, we need to get this sort of thing in is in the path syntax, which is extraordinarily complicated to begin with and very hard to extend in that mm -hmm. kind of way. Uh, but we could probably extend the other things, like the polygon element, the polyline element, uh, in very, very reasonably with element, with units. And that shouldn't be too hard, actually. So the most frustrating thing that you have to deal with in your, in your daily work with CSS? Um, I'm looking at Ethan. Oh, again? Jeez. Uh, uh, I guess the biggest pain point generally is actually just uh, testing, just device testing, um, which I actually like doing. I mean, it can actually help inform design, but um, it's just a manual process still. Um, and I know that there's been some, some work on you know, making dev tools a little bit more interoperable. Um, but uh, yeah, I think from a CSS standpoint, I think like my wish list stuff is really kind of the, the other thing. Like this, <laughs> and Tab's working on fixing all of that anyway, so yeah. yeah. So no, no pain, basically. So it's all good. Well, I mean, like I said, I, I drink for a number of reasons, but uh, yeah. Right. yeah. So, um, uh, another question, probably for David or Tab, uh, because you might have talked to Bert Boss about this, but he had once mentioned to me that uh, CSS was never meant to be permanent. Hmm. Uh, they made it as like a temporary or just to fill a need at that moment, and they never had the idea that it would grow to what it was now. So uh, that's where those problems are coming from. Is it, would you agree with that? Uh, well, I definitely agree with his characterization of how at least he intended it to start out. He wanted there to be CSS and something like that for documents, and we just all use Java for applications. Um, and he's, he'll still go on record as saying that's his ideal world. It seems a little crazy to me, whatever. Um, but honestly, in terms of all the languages that accidentally grew way beyond their original remit, I think CSS has done a pretty good job with itself. Um, there's relatively few bad legacy mistakes, unlike those random weirdnesses from JavaScript, random weirdnesses from HTML. Um, it's mostly just some holes that we're filling in now that are the big mistakes uh, mm. that we've just had for forever. Mm. But in terms of things that we can no longer change, relatively few. I think it's held up well. What kind of uh, logic do we need in CSS, David? Do we need more logic in CSS? And if so, what kind? But you see preprocessors offering types of logic that you, people kind of want in CSS, but they don't have it. Do you think a lot of that should be pulled into CSS? Um, I think probably some of it should be. Um, I think one of the things we need to do, look at carefully when we do that is how, what the actual, what the needs that people had were that were met by those preprocessors, mm -hmm. because there's often better or different ways we would want to meet them in a native implementation than in a preprocessor. Um, but we need to we need to understand why people use those particular features, um, just because as as somebody who works in C++ most of the time, working in a language where a preprocessor is a fundamental part of the language hmm. can actually be kind of painful, and there's a whole <laughs> bunch of reasons you don't want that. Hmm. Um, Tab, Tab might have stronger opinions about. I don't know about that. I think you're mostly right. So like one of the big ones that you discussed previously on the working group list is basically SAS's extend directive. Uh, you proposed a syntax that was a little bit less convenient, but was basically the exact functionality of, of extend. And going for basically just figuring out what the, what the actual use case was, what the actual problems were that were solved, and then seeing if we can do better, maybe we can't, maybe we can, um, is definitely the way to go there. 
But I, uh, in terms of like all the functionality that preprocessors do, mm -hmm. I don't know. I have to. I still have to evaluate that. I'm very, very undeclared on that. I love SAFs. I love the preprocessors in general, but I do not know how much of that I want to pull into pure CSS. I think a lot of that can be handled just by the extensibility hooks I want to add, but we'll <coughs> see what else is going on. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Um, what I want to do now is just so that we have enough time to do it. These are some of the greater thinkers in CSS at this moment in time, and you're here, so if you have questions for them, uh, feel free to raise your hand. There are people with microphones, and they'll give it to you and just ask away. Um, I'm not sure if this is really a question, but I encountered a little problem on the mobile phones with the height settings that uh, at a normal desktop computer you can set your height to 100 and when, when you do it on a mobile it will uh, take the height of your total web page. Anyway, there was, um, I, I, I thought it was weird because we take the width of a device different from the height and I was wondering why do we always scroll vertically and will this ever change into horizontally, for example, especially when you're thinking of non-Western uh, languages, sorry. Do you mean just like you set body height 100% and expect it to just be the height of the device? Exactly, yeah. Did you set height 100% on the HTML as well? Yeah, I, uh, I did. Okay, um, show yeah. me an example later and I'll see if I can debug it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hell of an offer right there. That, That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Damn. How many people could say that? One right? time offer. He's <laughs> These problems can, uh, it can be, sometimes be problematic to figure out exactly what you're taking the height off. I would suggest that that, that would be uh, uh, part of the problem here, but I, I, I can't say anything for sure without seeing your code. But it, it basically comes back to the viewport, uh, again, that I talk about so much. Um, which viewport? That's a basic question uh, you have to ask yourself here. And uh, I mean, historically, uh, height 100% has been very, very difficult for reasons I once read but also forgot. There were good reasons <laughs> at the time, but which uh, brings me to a question to you. Um, uh, about those reasons, I mean, height 100% was difficult, I think, basically because uh, the browser would take too much processing way back to try to calculate this. Is that roughly correct? Mm. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about 10 years back. Yeah. back. It, I think it depends on what you want height 100% to mean. Yeah. Um, because I think, um, I mean, CSS was originally designed for document layout, where, and in, in your traditional document layout algorithm, your width is the input to the algorithm and your height is the output to the algorithm. Mm. So if you want to say height 100%, you want to say height 100% of the parent. But you compute the width of the, in, in, in document layout, you compute the width of the parent before the width of the child and the height of the parent after the height of the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So, I think my mind is blue. Yeah, that's, that's, that's beautiful. So just because, just because the logic is the, data's, the widths are flowing in and the heights come out. Mm -hmm. So, wanting, <laughs> wanting height 100% to work in a, a sort of general case sort of requires a different sort of layout algorithm. And then the question is, what is that algorithm? What do you want it to do? Um, but, I mean, and how does it work? Uh, the whole idea of uh, uh, browser, uh, browser processing having something to do with it and being too heavy for the browsers of 15 years ago, that's just uh, mm. a, a, an idea I misremembered. Mm. Mm, not necessarily completely. Like, I think there were cases where <laughs> height 100% or per, where percentage heights would essentially say, oh, we did this algorithm. Now we're going to, now we've computed the height of the parent. Now let's go redo the children based on that result. Um, and that's expensive and it's not, like, it's not necessarily what people wanted with that percentage value anyway. Mm -hmm. Like they might have wanted something more like what table width calculation does with it. Right. Or what 
table height calculation does with it in the browsers where I think table height calculation is sane, which, by the way, is IE6 and lower. <laughs> uh, that said, though, note the CSS sizing spec, which has a keyword which basically does what height 100% is supposed to do. Hmm. Uh, it just goes and finds the first ancestor with a definite height, one that doesn't need to be calculated, and then subtracts all the relevant paddings, margins, et cetera, oh. and figures out, all right, the leftover space, that's how much I want to be. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's great. Is it already implemented in browsers? Not that one. Um, the rest of the keywords in the sizing spec are implemented by at least one browser. Uh, I know that they've been implemented for a long time in Firefox, and Chrome has done several of them, maybe all of them, but we don't yet have the height fill one because it's a little bit complicated and we're not 100% sure we have the right definition yet. So there's got to be an answer to your question somewhere in there. <laughs> uh, check, check back with us in 15 years, okay? <laughs> Let, let's take another one. All, All right. three of you talk guys have to do yes. microphone <laughs> management here. Well, uh, Apple just threw out uh, Objective-C in uh, favor of uh, Swift. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, we're not talking about CSS being some kind of, well, for something else and our grew to what it is. And we want uh, extensions mm -hmm. and maybe, well, we're doing object-oriented CSS. Uh, so shouldn't we throw out CSS and implement, implement something completely else, uh, well, just like Apple did uh, and just implemented Swift? We're actually replacing CSS with Swift, so that's already a done deal. Oh, great. <laughs> um, but more seriously, uh, revolutionary approaches like that almost never work on the web. They're really easy to do within a closed, well, really easy, easier to do within a closed ecosystem where somebody controls everything and can easily say from on high, you must do this or your apps will not run. Uh, the web, on the other hand, contains a trillion apps that are all running right now. And we're designed for compilers from a million years ago. Because um, that's basically what you're, you're just shipping source code when you're writing a web page and letting the, the user compile it on whatever stupid browser they have. Uh, and so on the web, evolutionary approaches, taking what already works and just making it work hopefully better and more, almost always are better than trying to throw whatever exists out. Because you can't ever throw it out. Even if we replace CSS, you'd still need to support CSS for the trillion pages that currently use it. And so you'd just be developing something new that does the same things and keeping the old one around. So eh, 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 yeah. costly. Yeah. This is actually what uh, was once an attempt to create XHTML2, and exactly the same thing that, that I've just told you happened. XHTML2 kind of reinvented some existing HTML elements, and because of that, it was not backwards compatible with what already existed on the web. And that's the main reason it never got into use, actually. Mm -hmm. We need a, a language that's backwards compatible with what we have now. So preprocessors do that because they compile into a language that is already supported in the browser, which is CSS or JavaScript. So I think a preprocessor is a better solution here. Yeah, yeah. so basically we, we want to and maybe we should, but we can't. I'm not even sure if we should, but we can't, yeah. If you want to replace CSS, do it by compiling into CSS, same way CoffeeScript works. Okay, next question. Somebody in the, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, how would you animate the height of a zero pix uh, uh, UL to its auto height? Second hardest problem in CSS, right behind centering. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It gets nice all the time. It's cool. Uh, so you can't because transitions only work over computed values, which are values that can be calculated without running layout more or less, whereas height auto requires you to run layout to figure out what the height is. There are some tricks you can do. You can animate max height instead from zero to some good guess at a value, and that roughly works. Um, and I hope we can figure out a way to make transitions run over used values. It sounds like David wants to talk. <laughs> my my long-term plan here is to find, is that if we can find a way to make auto work inside a calc expression, mm -hmm. then that solves the problem. Mm -hmm. And I don't, like, I, th I think that's probably doable. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's painful from an implementation point of view, but 
so probably not coming in the very near future. <laughs> but I, like, I, I think I think the long term plan is like. If we can make it work inside calc, yeah. then we can animate it. So you say calc auto times 0.5. Yeah. yeah. This is an idea I just had right now at this moment, never tested and so on. <laughs> but um, I thought that if you scale to zero um, on the y-axis mm. and then the content, uh, you scale it to a very large value and then you scale the parent to one, and uh, from that very large value hmm. of the element inside, you scale it back to one as well, <coughs> then you might obtain some kind of effect hmm. similar to that. Wow. But th it's going to be a bit, it's not going to be really smooth because I've done that kind of thing before and it's not really smooth. Yeah. I think I just we need new, new timing functions or. Yeah. Plus the ability to animate to infinity. Yeah, <laughs> animate to Before infinity because one over zero is infinity. That's why yeah. I said very large, and you can't, you know. Yeah, let's try that out though, because it's just the standard apply a transform and then apply its reverse. Yeah. Mm. Sounds plausible. I just do the max height thing. <laughs> that's that's awesome. <laughs> okay. Thanks okay. So. Uh, hello. Uh, do you have any opinion on uh, scope scope styles? Because uh, it would it be the next big thing in like in CSS history? It used to be implemented in Chrome, mm -hmm. like it was implemented in Firefox. What's what's the next thing about it? So we took it out of Chrome uh, on account of our implementation kind of sucked and we didn't think it was great in the first place. Um, most cases of scope styles, where you take a style sheet and just say only apply it to this element and its descendants, not the rest of the page, you actually want an even stronger guarantee. You want to be able to say this subtree of my document is independent from the outer pages styles. I'm just styling it and only it with these styles here. And that capability was never given to you by scoped styles. It is given to you by web components instead. If you put that tree, subtree in the shadow DOM of a component, then it won't get hit by the outer pages styles. It will get hit by your styles, by its own styles, and never the twain shall meet. Um, and so most cases where you think you want scope styles, you probably actually want a web component. Uh, and that is being implemented everywhere, so we're, we're pretty good there. Um, after we've done web components and we've figured out how to do all those styles uh, efficiently, we in Chrome will probably come back and see if we want to re-implement style scoped. We ripped it out because it was making uh, Shadow DOM implementation of styles excessively complicated. Um, and I don't know if Firefox is finding them complicated or worthwhile, or maybe it's just really trippy for y'all. Um, but at least that was our experience over in uh, the Blink project. So there, there's a chance that I will have a scoped styles uh, scoped uh, in a particular element, independent from the outer styles. Yeah. Okay. In near future. No, that's that's right now. Um, the next version of Chrome is shipping. I mean, with I mean, without. Uh, uh, web com components. Oh, without web components? No. In web components is the way you do it. So the, it's the only, no, no plans to do like in the same tree? I mean, that would basically be just be saying, do, like, make this shadow DOM, and we already have a way to do that, and it's called I just want to DOM. do this in, in plain CSS. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It's pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one. I, I think someone should, uh, oh, did you want to say something, Dave? Yeah. Oh, just, I, I'm not, I, I'm not quite as convinced of, as Tab is that scoped styles aren't useful, but. Yeah. I'm not saying they're not useful, just less useful than people think. <laughs> Continue now. Okay, we've, where, because Hit has got his hand up, who are we going to here? Let's go, for him. Let's, let's go over here. Hi, um, I'm just wondering if anyone has any thoughts about working on email CSS standards, because that's an area that didn't receive any love. And I know people hate it, but it's a fact that it's happening to people, and we need to work on it, and it would, we could use some help. Email? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> HTML right, email, well, yes. So we'll talk there, that. There is that a CSS issue or is that an HTML? Or is that a there's a nothing issue? wrong spec like structurally from just letting everything apply to emails as well. I mean, there's some 
potential issues, you're running a whole bunch of random web pages inside of your web page uh, if you open up an email. But overall, there's nothing stopping us, stopping mail programs from uh, allowing CSS and HTML and your emails. Um, it's largely just been mail programs have been complete shit forever. Some, but a lot of them nowadays do allow at least some types. A whole bunch of them allow font face now, for example. Um, they've always allowed mild amounts of styling. Um, so mostly it's just a matter of mail programs actually implementing HTML renderers and then doing so in a way that's reasonably safe uh, to embed a whole bunch of effectively maybe hostile web pages. Um, that's why I'm talking about page. standards because a lot of um, the new email apps that are developed for mobile, um, <laughs> Like, for example, the one that Google makes. Mm -hmm. um, they are very controlling about them, and they want to render, um, to make their version of the user experience be rendered in the email client. So for us, it's, it's very difficult to actually create something that makes sense and actually converts. Um, so I, standards would be nice. Well. What I'm saying is the standards exist. They just don't choose not to follow them for the most part. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Blame the vendors is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It would probably help if uh, you, you know, Outlook and things like that didn't use Microsoft Word uh, as a rendering engine, I guess. Yeah, but that's, that's like IE6, right? And IE7. But, Even um, weirder. It's re I'm, yeah. I'm, we're talking about the new email clients that are developed right now. Yeah. And well, if the vendors do not choose to use standards like mm -hmm. things that actually make sense um, shouldn't we like have some sort of because if for example all browsers in the world would decide actually to not follow standards then um, what would happen then can we apply the same thing for email well adding more standards won't solve that problem um, so it's purely a matter of you have to apply pressure to vendors give your money to mail clients that uh, render a more attractive way so they become more successful um, and file bugs against ones that have open bug trackers otherwise. That's really all you can do. You can't make people implement standards. You can simply influence them and try to pressure them into doing so. That's why I asked yeah. if there are any thoughts on doing something about that. Yeah, yeah I think that's a, um, that's a hard one to answer. You know. um, let's, let's take... Uh, well, we have time for a couple more. Let's go up here in front. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask about semantics because uh, some time ago, HTML5 introduced new tags. I introduced a uh, document outline. Uh, barely nobody read that, and even less people implemented it right. And then we will have web components, and uh, there is via IRA. And uh, do stick still semantics matter when making web sites? Um, I'll, I, I'll try to answer this one and then I'll hand it over to, well, Tap or someone else. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, it's, I appreciate it's a really big uh, problem. Um, Tim Berners-Lee invented uh, the H tag uh, somewhere in the middle of the 1990s and that was what we were going to have um, instead of um, H1 to H6, which is sort of clumsy and also a finite set. So then much later, um, Ian Hickson decided, um, well, hey, actually, we will have, sec um, sorry, I should have explained, with section elements. That was going to be in the original HTML spec, um, or thereabouts. Um, and uh, then much later, as you say, in the HTML5 spec, we get all these new sectioning elements. And then the advice was, well, you can use H1 like it was an H tag, right? Um, but of course that doesn't work and like the um, backwards compatibility issue with CSS, um, the main people who suffer um, from using H1s everywhere are screen reader users because suddenly their page is full of top level headings. It's just a lot of shouting and there's no structure, right? So um, what um, uh, Steve Faulkner and some others um, who, who um, Steve works with the W3C um, HTML working group. Uh, he has got into lots of arguments with people who think, well, it doesn't matter. And he's pushing this and saying, well, actually, it does for accessibility, and that's a big deal. 
So what he's doing now is he's prototyping the H element as um, an expression of an actual calculated document outline um, by using JavaScript as a polyfill to calculate the nesting level of each heading and then applying an area level attribute. So it will, using a bit of JavaScript scopes within a web component, um, it's sort of mimicking that and he's using that as a sort of Trojan horse to try and get browsers interested in actually implementing the document outline properly. And uh, so on the note of web components and its effects on semantics, um, if you've ever used jQuery widgets and whatnot, particularly ones developed by good companies like Filament Group and whatnot, uh, they work really well. They use good design and good use of ARIA um, really well so that you automatically get great accessibility out of these widgets. You can do the same things with web components. Web components is more or less just jQuery widgets, but better. Um, so for a lot of cases, yeah, one well-designed widget can do a lot of good as a web component. Further though, um, web components allow an interesting sort of distributed semantic knowledge about things. If some, right now, if you develop um, a particular type of component, it's probably just going to be a div with a class on it. Whereas if you write a particular web component and distribute it and it gets popular, that tag name is a much more direct um, statement of intent here. Mm -hmm. Something that we can harvest later on, that search engines can become aware of and um, expose more readily in their data models. And that can also inform our introduction of new official elements in the future. Uh, so there's interesting arguments from data mining on uh, custom elements that we could actually improve semantics over time with them better than we could just by imagining new elements ab initio. OK. We have time for one more, I think. Hi. So I want to make a question about element queries. Uh, what do you think about is real useful and there is somebody that is working on? So, Ethan, you want to sure. talk about yeah. <clears throat> um, So the I mentioned before with the responsive images community group just put out a use cases document to sort of say that there's there's a need for uh, element queries or some, some some mechanism for affecting the design of an element um, at different at different native widths. Um, I don't like there there have been a lot of really valid critiques of um, element queries from a technical standpoint. I think T Tab's written a number of them, and they're very, very good, and I'd recommend checking them out because I don't think anyone's arguing that they're not valuable, but I think there's a lot of agreement that they're also going to be very difficult to implement. So I get the sense it's just a conversation that sort of just started to kind of happen in sort of a more formal way, and so I'm, I, I don't know. I'm kind of interested to see where it goes. But yeah, and um, you know, ultimately the problem you have to solve is if my container is less than 400 pixels, I want to be 500 pixels. Right. Now what? Um, and that's not something you can solve just by naively putting element queries into the language. Right. Uh, you need something more like iframe light, because mm -hmm. we have element queries today. They're called iframes. Right. If you use a media query in an iframe, it's based on the width of the iframe itself. Those are just super heavyweight, terrible to work with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but something like that, the important part of iframes is that they don't care about what their contents are. They get sized as if they are completely empty. Right. Um, and something like that, some mechanism that can flip an element into that kind of state, where it just sizes itself as if it's empty, not caring about its contents, then that element could be a thing you can base an element query off mm -hmm. of. Um, and this sort of thing can be very useful. You just make your sidebar that um, sort of independent thing, and suddenly all the widgets in your sidebar can now respond to the width of the sidebar, et cetera. I think that's roughly the approach that we'll have to take eventually. Um, figuring out exactly how to do so and exactly what we need out of it uh, is the interesting thing, and I'm really glad the responsive images community group is working on that now. Yeah. So I'd, I'd, I'd totally recommend like checking out Tab's posts because they're really valuable. I think just talking about some of the roadblocks as well as the use case document. Um, so yeah. Okay. Well. Let, we're going to conclude the panel right now, so I'd like a big round of applause for the speakers. So.